welcome to the Danube Institute. Uh, we're delighted to have you all here this evening. My name is Melissa O'Sullivan. Here comes Mr. Martoni, former head of the BLA under which we shelter. Um, I think it's just amazing that for this topic, we have the fabulous George Yu, who's accompanied by his lovely wife, Jennifer, here from Singapore for us to have a conversation on the Indo-Pacific region. With both a diplomatic and military background, Yu is well qualified to talk on issues of security, as well as the broader geopolitical and geoeconomic economic issues of these neighboring countries, with Singapore situated in the heart of the Indo-Pacific region and occupying a relatively neutral position. Yu is a diplomat who also has a distinguished military career, having served in the Singapore Army, where he rose to the rank of Brigadier General. He also served in the Singapore, Singapore Air Force. He was Chief of Staff of the Air Force and Director of Joint Operations and Planning at the Ministry of Defense. He's a former member of the governing People's Action Party. He was an MP. He served as many, several ministries, Minister for Information, the Arts, Health. So he has a very broad base of knowledge, and we're just so happy to have someone of his stature here. After his remarks, he'll be joined by Dr. David Martin Jones, who's Director of Research here at the Danube Institute, who will act as our moderator for this evening's program. Joining the conversation will be our own Dr. Choba Horvath a research fellow with the Danube Institute and an Asian specialist. And also Dr. Victor Esterhazy of the International Hungarian Institute of International Affairs, and he's research director there. So we have a super talented panel tonight. I will ask for Mr. Yu to come take the podium and I'll retire to the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today as a guest of the Danube Institute to talk about um, current affairs. Uh, I readily accepted this invitation because for some reason I've had a long interest in Hungary. I first came here with an Anglican minister, a friend I made in Cambridge, who said, would like to follow me for a drive through Central Europe. We took an Aeroflot flight, uh, transited through Moscow, where he happily distributed Bibles, and I did not know him when I was there. We arrived in Budapest, picked up an AV car, stayed in an, a kind of Airbnb apartment, and spent four happy days here. It's a long time ago, 1979, and I've only some vague memories, but strong impressions of Budapest, of Estegom, of Lake Balaton. And I'm happy that uh, uh, Chaba from the Institute brought me to Estegom and Visegrad on Saturday, and uh, 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 Yuli brought me to Lake Balaton for a swim yesterday. And of course, it was a different world, uh, and it will continue to be a different world as we go forward. Uh, I am always intrigued by the position uh, Prime Minister Orban has taken, and he sticks out because, because he wants to preserve Hungary's identity. It's not easy for a relatively small population to preserve your identity. I mean, 10 million in Hungary, maybe 5 million outside Hungary, ballpark numbers. But to maintain your sense of yourself, translating books, maintaining your literature, it's not easy in, in an age of globalization. But the European peoples have always been able to do, to do this. I've been advisor to ESA Business School in Barcelona for many years. And there is a Catalonian identity and a Catalonian spirit. When I was a trade minister, 
I signed our free trade agreement with the European Free Trade Association in Iceland. And there, a tiny population, but a very profound sense of itself and a refusal to, be, to melt into a larger reality. Of course, they're international, they're cosmopolitan, but they know they are the Icelandic people. So this is Europe with this strong sense of separate, evo separate evolutions, but part of a, part of a wider co-evolution of the European peoples, which created the European Union. China stands in great contrast. There's no such diversity in China. There are regional variations, obviously, in food, in customs, uh, in, in, in accents, uh, in social preferences. So divorce rates, uh, crime rates for different things. I mean, you, you, can, you have an atlas of that in China. And there are regional differences. But by and large, in China, 92% of the people are Han people. And Han people have one literature. I mean, Europe has multiple literatures, but China has one literature. So at the two ends of the Eurasian landmass are two separate sets of social evolution over the centuries. And Hungary, Hungary is probably the most Asian of the European peoples. So you put your first name, you put your family name first. Now the chopsticks people can understand this. In, 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 in Japan, they also put their family name first. But after the Second World War, well, to accommodate the needs of globalization, they invert it. But among themselves, they have the family name first. And the Japanese PMO a few years ago said, no, even internationally, we should put our family name first. But in practice, it will take time. But here you put your family name first. Is this just convention? Or does it reflect something deeper? It must reflect something deeper. That somehow, in your identity, the group comes before the individual. Among tribal peoples, say the Arabs, they are moving all the time. So you, you can't identify people by family name because we all have the same family name. So you identify by yourself by who's your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather. Of course, there's a tribal name which comes at the end. So the Hungarian people have always fascinated me in their assertiveness of a separate identity. When I was in school, in my stamp collection, the biggest stamps came from Hungary, Magia Posta. I don't know why, but it always fascinated me why a small country should want to have the biggest stamps of anybody else. There is a certain impulse. Your stamps have become smaller, but I don't think the underlying impulse have changed. So when I listen to Viktor Orban, I say, oh, there's something in the history of the people which speaks out through him now. Of course, even within Hungary, he's a controversial figure, but, but there is this strain, there's this streak in you. I, I talk about Hungary, I talk about Asia, because Europe will have a very big role in deciding the big issue of war and peace in the world. If Europe lightly takes American positions, and the Americans feel that they have the support of the entire Western world except Russia, the chances of a clash with China may become more likely. Take the issue of Taiwan, which many European leaders jump onto without knowing the history, forgetting that the status of Taiwan was settled in the Cairo Declaration and confirmed in the Potsdam Proclamation, and therefore a status which was legally agreed to by all the major Victoria powers. And to lightly now say, well, you know, the Taiwanese people should have a referendum, maybe they should consider 
being different. Yes, you must consider the views of local people. But you push that principle, well, what about Crimea? What about Catalonia? What about Scotland? Maybe one day Wales? Maybe the northern part of Serbia? The whole of Africa would dissolve into violence if you say referendums should decide political boundaries. So to say the issue of Taiwan is negotiable, depends. Now for the Chinese, this is, they say, the core of all core interests and already agreed to for a long time. But in recent years, for other reasons, being played lightly. They react neurologically. And the Americans know that if they resile from the one China position, then they are on a collision course. So Blinken, in his recent visit, affirmed to Xi Jinping, I think less than a day ago, or maybe a day ago, that no, we hold to that position. But in Europe, the knowledge of history has weakened. It has been an obsession with your own internal construction. The British, who, who used to understand distant parts of the empire intimately in order to divide and rule, they've lost that knowledge. When I was trade minister, I met a deputy minister from the UK, from Scotland, and I was shocked by how little he knew about Asia. When his forebears established, say, the underpinnings of Hong Kong, the Scottish legacy in Hong Kong, it's a profound legacy, but a younger generation would not know it. So this issue of Taiwan is dangerous because there is no deep understanding. And in the coming years, we have to anticipate a world where the Chinese GDP may equal that of the US and EU combined. It's not inconceivable. China's GDP per capita is one-fifth of the US today. If it reaches half that of the US, then its GDP would be that of the US and the EU combined, more or less. It's just arithmetic. Is it inconceivable that China's per capita GDP should reach half that of the US? But they're hardworking people. They have strong families. They're high savers. They study. They're obsessed with examinations. In classical music, they're producing, there are tens of millions of Chinese students learning music in China. So it's entirely possible that a per capita GDP will reach half that of the US. If it becomes even more than half that of the US, then its economy will be that of the US, EU, and Japan combined. So we're talking about a phenomenon which is not small. Everyone will be affected, every family, every company, whether for offensive reasons or defensive reasons. And when, if you are a company and you have a huge market developing, you study that market thoroughly, in detail. But if you watch how geopolitics is being man managed today, about statements being made, policies being formulated about China, I look at some of these individuals and ask myself, how much do they understand China? And yet they're speaking as if China is reducible to a few stock phrases. It's an autocracy. Uh, Xi Jinping is uh, abandoned what uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping ad advised China to do. Reducing China to a few slogans, stock phrases, and thinking that on that basis you can make policy. You're bound to make big mistakes. So when I come to Hungary, being also from a small country, you have a suitably modest view about your own ability to change the world. And therefore, you have to understand the world so that you can act skillfully. So in Singapore, we know you can't change the world. You could accept the world for what it is. So we have close links to America. So we study America. We send people there. 
I think we understand America to some degree. Uh, we are ethnically three quarters Chinese, and we know China is going to become more and more important to us, so we study China. And I hope European leaders will gradually deepen the understanding of China and take China seriously against its own history and civilization. I go back to the Jesuits when they went to China. I mean, when Francis Xavier told Ignatius, I will go convert China. The audacity of that decision. Of course, he failed. He didn't even reach the Chinese mainland. But when Matteo Ricci went there, he first dressed himself as a monk, thinking that the Chinese would respect monks the way Europeans respected monks. He found that the Chinese literati looked down on monks. They respected scholarship. Well, he was one of the most brilliant men Europe has ever produced with an encyclopedic memory. So if they respect scholars, he was a scholar. He dressed as a scholar. He studied Chinese. He mastered the Chinese classics. And he knew that he could only evangelize by getting into their minds, understanding their philosophy, translating Deus into Chinese was a difficult task. Francis Xavier took the name, which, which turned out to be the name of a minor Japanese deity. It didn't get him anywhere. Matteo Ricci, realizing that the Chinese have an a-religious tradition, but accepted that there was one heaven, which they call Tian, one heaven, monotheistic, that the emperor was the emperor of all of heaven, that all reality is below heaven. And that if you as ruler loses the mandate of heaven, then it is morally justifiable to overthrow you. You have lost Tian Ming, the mandate. So God, he finally translated as the Lord of heaven, Tian Zhu. And till today, the Chinese translation for the Roman Catholic Church is Tian Zhu Jiao, the religion of the Lord of heaven. The Jesuits had to do this because they only had their mouths. They didn't have boats and gunboats. When they produced the catechism books, Jesus and Mary and the apostles were all Chinese. How could they not be if you want to, if you want to persuade the Chinese that you have a superior set of beliefs? But in the 19th century, when European missionaries had the support of guns and gunboats, Jesus and Mary became European. They had blue eyes. And Chinese revolutionaries knew that if your gods are foreign gods, then their domination of you is complete. The way Cortes was able to subjugate the Aztecs because the Aztecs believed that a white god would come to redeem them. So when Xi Jinping said Christianity has to be sinicized, the reaction in the West is, there you are, there you go again. And this autocrat wanting to uh, sully the, the Christian inheritance. But this Pope thinks differently. He has a mission to reconcile with China. For seven years, I was helping him in the Vatican on administrative reform because he wanted the Chinese. And I had lost the elections. And someone told one of the cardinals that I was available. And so I got roped in. I only found out a few years later how I, I was recruited into this exercise. When he went to Guadalupe and meditated on the image of Our Lady, our Lady has had hundreds of apparitions around the world. But in only one did she leave her image, which was in Guadalupe. And it was of her self as a mestiza. So this was the Pope's meditation, that God appears to us 
not as an abstraction, but in our deepest identity. When he went to visit the Rohingyas in the refugee camp in Bangladesh, he told them, God is Rohingya, not just to comfort them, but something he believes in. When I address mainland alumni of Peking University, I say, God, God is Chinese. God has to be Chinese if Christianity is to have any impact in China. God is Hungarian. How can he not be? So human identity is not something to be lightly waved away as if it is shallow programming. Identity is what makes us civilized. It's what makes us spiritual. Because each of us is created uniquely. The European Union was established on the Catholic principle of subsidiarity, which means nothing should be taken from the individual to harm him. The properties of a parish belong to the parish under canon law. The bishop cannot commandeer the properties of a parish. He can tax the parish. He cannot expropriate the parish. So every, at every level, power can only be taken away to benefit the, the individual or the group from which it is taken away. But over the years, the European Union has grown. It's become highly politicized at a, in, its, in, its, in, in its attitudes. So when I see little Hungary asserting its own difference, wanting to preserve its own identity, there's a flutter in my heart. Because I also come from a small country where we, where we treasure our own, diff, our own autonomy and identity. And maybe this is the great struggle in the world today. You have an identity, and you have larger groupings which want to take that away for reasons of efficiency, because it's so much more convenient to have one language, one internet, one chat GPT. But we know at the same time that you have one common language, one internet, one chat GPT, in the end you lose your identity. Li Kai-Fu, who wrote this book, The Superpower Contest in AI Between the US and China, we were at a meeting in Venice recently. He said, in Muslim countries, they worry about chat GPT. You say, Draw an image of Muhammad. You produce you many images of Muhammad. His argument is chat GPT is value laden. And right now it's been trained on mostly the English language. They say that after a few more years, chat GPT will gobble up information all over the world. I'm not so sure. Because in China, they will have a separate universe. In Europe, whether you can or not, I do not know, but you certainly have a wish to have a separate universe. So there is a tension between autonomy, your free will, and the needs of a larger polity. And this is a great struggle in the world today. And maybe in that struggle, Hungary and Singapore find common cause. Maybe I end here and we have our conversation. Thank you. George, that was tremendous. Um, so in order to uh, respond to your uh, very intriguing remarks on the relationship between Hungary, Singapore, and the role of small nations, which I think is really intriguing, we're going to have two commentaries. Um, firstly, um, Choba uh, Horvath, who's going to say a few things. And then Victor. So, Chopper, do you want to Is it on? Okay, it's on. So, uh, so uh, right now, uh, we, we can see two important diplomatic visits. Uh, one 
of one of uh, Anthony Blinken uh, to uh, China, and the other by Narendra Modi to the US. And I would like to ask you about these, the, the, the implications and significance and I think many of us followed closely uh, Blinken's visit. He had many hours of conversation with the Chinese Foreign Minister, Qing Kang, with the Chinese State Councillor for Foreign Affairs, Wang Yi, and then he called on Xi Jinping. Uh, both sides described the talks as uh, candid and constructive, and that uh, high-level channels of communication should be kept open. Blinken gave a press conference after that, he said it was a robust exchange, uh, but the general tone was a slight lowering of temperature in the bilateral relations between the US and China. I think in the short term, uh, relations will not get worse. Uh, it's partly because of coming presidential elections in the US and worries about the economy. You remember in 2008, when we had a global financial crisis, the G7 was not able to generate sufficient global demand. George Bush convened the first G20 summit. In the following year, in 2009, Gordon Brown in London got the countries together to pump prime. And China pulled its weight. China uh, weighed in. And in three years, China poured more concrete than the US in this entire history. It created big distortions in the Chinese economy, and they had no gratitude for it. If the world goes into another financial crisis because of the huge liquidity overhang resulting from COVID, there's no G20, G20 now because the Western countries won't sit with Russia on the same table, and China will be more circumspect. So our ability to recover from a lack of demand in the new financial crisis will be greatly reduced. And I think that's one reason why the US wants communications with China, particularly Yellen, the Treasury, because they worry. In the presidential year, if the economy is mismanaged, Trump will come back. And in the US now, anything they can do to, to remove Trump they would do. Um, so there's a big domestic fight in the US, which, is, which explains part of the reason why they want better communication with China. The other reason is, of course, the Ukraine war. Right now, all sides are giving war a chance, a final chance. But I think uh, in, the, in six months, in a year and a half, there'll be a strong push towards having a ceasefire. Uh, and China will have to play some kind of a role. So I think these are the two main reasons why relations between the US and China in the short term will improve. Uh, Modi's visit to China, of course the US would want India to weigh in on its side against China. Uh, but India is too old a civilization, too... too have too great a sense of itself to be made use of anybody. Uh, I tell my American friends, you think you make use of India? Well, India will make use of you too. And on the Ukraine war, despite US pressure, India maintains its own position. So if the US can add pressure on China to help India in its border talks with China, that's helpful. But if it's against Indian interests, India will act separately. But for the time being, it behooves India to sit on every table and to improve relations with the US. Uh, this year, the BRICS, uh, the G20 meeting will be in India. Uh, I know the two sides are talking. There could be a breakthrough. Uh, Modi made a gesture of friendship in Bali, uh, but it was just a gesture. Whether they can find enough agreement on the border to, to restore bilateral relations, I don't know. Do you want to follow that up at all? Do you, do you, do you want to ask anything further? No. Okay. Picture. 
Should I ask or make a short comment? Make a short comment. Yeah. Uh, when I had the request to participate in discussion on the Indo-Pacific, I, I had to sit down and, and think it over, what does it mean Indo-Pacific for me? And uh, I have to admit that in the last decade, there were only two major geopolitical concepts which became extremely popular. One was the Indo-Pacific, but the other was the Battle Road Initiative. <coughs> and I, I used to teach geopolitics, and it came to my mind that, well, well is it really new? Okay, currently we are talking about this. There are a lot of events like today on this issue, but are they really new? Or this is the same as we used to talk about the continental uh, powers versus the maritime uh, powers. And when we so like think about Mackinder, the axis of Russia and China, or the, or the so-called sea power uh, coalition with the, led by the United States, has a kind of a resonance of this kind of uh, concepts. So it came to my mind for me that is it, what are these concepts are about? Is it about the global leadership? So who is going to lead the international system? The international system is in many ways seems to be sick. And if I understand well, the claim of the Indo-Pacific strategy is to maintain the rules-based international order, the open Indo-Pacific, uh, but this necessarily means to, to keep the power position of the United States and maintain those alliances on the top of the hierarchy. And then it comes to my mind that what could be the role of Europe in this kind of power contest? So I very would like to ask uh, George's opinion on how do you see what could be the role of, of Europe in this power context and, and within, within, within this framework. Do you agree with this framework that this is about of hierarchy and who is leading the international uh, order and what could be the place of Europe in this regard? And if, we, if you already mentioned the small country perspective, what a small country like Hungary should think about the Indo-Pacific and do we really need to figure out a strategy to, to deal with this changing environment? Whether we are talking about the Indo-Pacific or Quad or AUKUS, the elephant in the room is China. And sometimes uh, China is not even mentioned in the communique. But everybody knows that the communique is about China. Why is, such, why is China such a challenge to everybody? It's because of its size and homogeneity. Why are the Chinese people so homogeneous? Historically, Chinese civilization has organized more human beings than any other human group. Why is the case? Well, my belief is, it's because of paper. One important reason is paper. For centuries, China had a monopoly of paper. With paper, you can record more bits and bytes than on parchment, on leather, on papyrus, on stone tablets. So for centuries, China had a level of information, had a level of data intensity in the way it was organized, which nobody else had. So the programmers were the scholars. Their whole life was spent on mastering the language and on writing. So a brush on paper gives you orders of magnitude in terms of information storage and processing than any other form of writing material. And China had that as a monopoly for centuries. Finally, in the 8th century, in the battle in Central Asia, the Abbasids captured Chinese prisoners of war who knew how to make paper. And so in Samarkand, in Pokhara, in, in, in Damascus, Baghdad, they had paper mills. And from then on, Islamic civilization went through a huge transformation. They produced scholars, they had mathematics. By the year 1000, it reached Cairo. By the year 1002, it reached Muslim Spain. And the Muslims in turn wanted to keep it a monopoly and not let the Europeans know how to make paper. But it leached out to Northern Italy. And there the Renaissance began. I was in Montserrat uh, a month ago. For centuries, the Benedictines, the monks, 
maintain the coding of European civilization, painfully on parchment. The Swiss tell me that because the monasteries were most intact in Switzerland, some of the most important records were in the Benedictine monasteries in Switzerland, like St. Gallen. But once you had paper and printing, everything changed. So the Chinese have always depended on information and data to organize people. Now, Alan Turing had this insight that if you have an unlimited amount of paper, you can do an unlimited amount of algorithmic computation given enough time. And the more computation you can do, the more people you can organize. Then you see human society as a computational system. So that's the reason why China is so big. It has a culture, it created examinations, it created a meritocratic civil service, which the Jesuits informed Europe about, which created civil services in Europe, particularly the French. And when you think about, about that, it is because China is so big that every time it rises, it's a challenge to everybody. But will it be aggressive? I don't think it will be aggressive because it has a deep instinct to preserve its own homogeneity. So China has always built walls around itself. It has walls, physical walls, it has walls for culture, for, 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 for biological for tissues, for uh, Hollywood movies, for capital markets. And during COVID, it has the most impressive wall of all, the biological wall of China. So this is the instinct of China, that every time there's a crisis, it shuts the gates because it has a huge internal universe and a, really a self-sufficient internal economy. So the elephant in the room in all these conversations is China and how to accommodate, accept a China that threatens Western dominance, which Westerners have taken for granted for 200 years, and now saying, oh, we may lose it. And the Americans who see themselves dominant in all fields, worrying that they may lose it. That's, um, I suppose the other thing that comes out of that, George, is um, does this mean that we're in a clash of civilizations um, format now? That if, if the international order as an institutional rules based order is fading away, that we're now facing what Huntington called a clash of civilizations in 1997, becoming more um, a feature of what becomes a, a multipolar world, that you've got a very clear Chinese sense of a civilization. You've got a Russian sense of its own civilization. You've got an India with a sense of its own civilization and a West that's kind of undermining its own civilization through wokeness. Do you think this is the, the paradigm for the world going forward? The, the danger in the West is you see China in your own image against your own template. So all this theorizing over the Thucydidean trap and the Peloponnesian War, that somehow China fits into a European paradigm. Of course, there's an equivalent danger on the other side that China sees others in its own image, but it's a much smaller danger than Europeans seeing China uh, in its own image. If China were like the Soviet Union, evangelical, expansionary, then yes, the clash is inevitable. But that's not China's nature. Their instinct is, when there's a crisis, sh <coughs> shut the gates, keep out the foreigners, keep Chinese in. That's always been their instinct. It is not the Russian instinct. The Russian instinct is, when I'm threatened, I expand. The more I'm threatened, the more I have to expand. The Chinese instinct is, the more I'm threatened, the more I hunker down and block out foreigners. So for decades under Mao Zedong, when they were finding their own self, they just kept out foreigners. 
I know this personally because my mother came from China. My parents were married in China in 1937. A month later, the Japanese invaded, they rushed back. She left China as a young bride of 19. She could not go back to 1978. So during those decades, China turned inwards. That is the nature of Chinese society. So with China, with Russia, I'm not enough of an expert. I think there's, there will be a clash. But with China, there's no necessary clash. Mm. So in, in terms of um, the evolving world picture, and particularly in geoeconomic terms, as you said, you know, the, the West seems to be facing uh, an ongoing um, huge inflationary monetary problem. There's not that problem in China or in Southeast Asia, it seems. Why is that? Did, I mean, how effectively? I mean, I was just looking at GDP P figures for Singapore recently. Like the, actually, the Singaporean economy is growing at about 3%, I think, per annum. Its interest rates are something like 4%, and its um, uh, inflation is below 6%, uh, 5%. If any European or you know, the Western economy had those kinds of figures, people would be jumping for joy, I think. How has Singapore done that? And, and I think the, the, the picture in China and Asia generally is not, not as bad as it is in Europe. This year, ASEAN's trade with China will reach $1 trillion. It is significantly bigger than China's trade with the US, than China's trade with Europe, than Europe's trade with America. And in the coming years, the economies of Southeast Asia and China will grow together. And that's one reason why we are doing relatively well. May I make this point? Uh, because it may surprise you that China was the least damaged economy during COVID. China was the last country to open up, which is the best strategy in an epidemic. China had the fewest number of deaths per million than any other major country. In 2020, no, while the rest of us were at home behind our screens and then ordering from Amazon or whatever, you know, and then looking forward to the parcels which are delivered through our doors, who made the things in the parcels? They're all made in China. So for three years, China's factories produce for the entire world. In 2020, China's trade surplus, merchandise trade surplus, was $510 billion. In 2021, it became $670 billion US. In 2022, when you had the, Sh the Shanghai lockdown and people said that China was really in horror and confusion, China's trade surplus went up to $870 billion. China did not have to print money unlike Europe or America or Japan. And that's why today, while interest rates are trending up everywhere, in China, interest rates are trending down. This gives the Chinese government enormous policy flexibility. And if China does well, Hong Kong will do well, Singapore will do well. <laughs> Very good. Uh the other area that we, you know, you, you mentioned but didn't develop very much is obviously, you know, the great problem for Europe and to some extent for China as well is, is the Ukraine situation. And, um, that, you know, in, in, well, in Britain and, and America, uh, people are often skeptical about China's, you know, sort of desire for peace in Ukraine. And yet, China doesn't give Russia any uh, armaments. And um, I think from what I understand of ch Chinese um, interviewers I've been involved with, um, they're genuinely, genuinely quite concerned about what will happen 
um, if there isn't peace in Ukraine relatively quickly. I wondered what you could say further about China's role with regard to Russia and the Ukraine situation and whether any kind of peacekeeping role it could play going forward. At an abstract strategic level, China benefits from the Ukraine war because it takes away American attention. I mean, the crosshairs, instead of being on China, has shifted to Russia. And I think that takes heat away from China. So at that level, they are a beneficiary. China is triangulating. It, will, it doesn't want Russia to collapse because then China will be fully exposed to Western pressure. So it will help to shore up Russia economically. Militarily, it'd rather not get involved. In any case, Russia may not need it. So they rather have an intermediate position where they're close to Russia, but seen as a peacemaker. That is a very good position for China to be in, which is exactly the position they're taking right now. To be a peacemaker, to help Russia economically, to stay close to Russia, and to help develop Russia as a separate pole in a multipolar world. They want Europe to be a separate pole. They know that Europe will always be close to America. But Europe has got its own interests. So they're working separately on Germany, on Italy, on France, on Hungary, on others. That look, you have your own interests. Yes, you're close to the Americans. You need the Americans to defend you. But you need not follow the Americans on all issues, and certainly not on Taiwan. That is Chinese strategy. To have a strong Europe, to have a strong euro, because this gives them diversification. My own view, if I may be a little speculative, and, and you, you will disagree with me, of course. Uh, I see the world becoming multipolar. In this multipolar world, China will be a big pole. Russia, a smallish pole, but bristling with weapons and they'll be quite close to each other. Then on the other side, you have the American pole, which is very big, also bristling with weapons, and the European pole, which is big, <coughs> but quite neutered in terms of its military capability, and they will stick together. Then you have India as a separate pole, and there'll be others like Brazil and South Africa and ASEAN as a little cluster, like uh, asteroids <laughs> clumped together. I think this would be how the world is. And synaptic connections would be very important. They will not be exclusive. They will all be connections. Singapore will try to have maximum number of connections to all the poles. I think Hungary will also develop synaptic connections in all directions. You, see? you can't change how the poles configure because these forces are too big. But whatever the configuration, we find our own connections in order to survive. So this, this is, uh, for me, a helpful way to look at an unfolding world. And if you know that that's how the world is going, you float in that direction. Then you avoid unnecessary unhappinesses. <laughs> in that world, the US should be primus inter Paris. If our American I would help to crystallize such a world. It has always been Kissinger's view. Yeah. America should move closer to everybody else. So you have a conflict, I will have the ability to tip it one way or the other, between China and Russia, between China and Japan, between Europe and Russia, move close to everybody. Then you will be the first among equals because you have the culture to do that, because of the English language. And you can achieve primacy with much less effort. Whereas the current tendency to prevent China from rising and to stay dominant, mm. I think is exhausting and financially not sustainable. There you go. Choma, do you want? 
Okay, so regarding the multipolar uh, tendencies, uh, in Asia, uh, how much do you think uh, do can, uh, each country uh, has the capacity to become a pole on its own? Like, can India catch up to the level of China and the US? Can Indonesia become a, a smaller pole? Can Japan sustain a position between China and the, U the US as a smaller pole on its own? India will be its own pole because it's, it's got bulk, it's got history, it has geography. Uh, Japan, no. Japan will be a satellite of the Americans, uh, principally because it's completely dependent on the U.S. nuclear umbrella. But if the U.S. weakens, then it will f seek its own autonomy as part of which you go further in the current direction of remilitarization. So for the time being, a satellite. But 20, 30 years from now, I'm not sure. Indonesia will not be its own pole because Indonesia knows that if Southeast Asia is balkanized, it'd be a big problem for Indonesia. So Indonesia's preference is to anchor ASEAN so ASEAN, we have two anchors. Indonesia now, eventually Vietnam also, because they are very dynamic people and a dynamic economy. Uh, but none will be able to dominate all 10. But these two will be significant weights in the configuration. And if ASEAN can stick together as a grouping, 700 million people with a significant GDP, it will be a weak pole in that system. And the poll where people feel, yeah, you know, you, you are fair, you are neutral. And that neutrality is itself a strategic asset. So every time there's a major meeting, they say go to ASEAN. Because everybody is welcome in ASEAN. No one is unwelcome in ASEAN. No one dislikes going to ASEAN. So when the US met North Korea, Trump met Kim Jong-un, both meetings were in ASEAN. ASEAN provides a neutral platform around which all the major powers, Europe, China, US, North Korea, South Korea, everybody sits around the same table. And that's ASEAN's strength. ASEAN's weakness becomes its strength. And to that extent, it can be a weak pole. Yeah. <laughs> well, we discussed uh, multipolarization, and, and I would like to ask your experience because in Hungary, if I understand well the situation, the Hungarian government tried to maintain this multi-vector foreign policy. And how do you see, is it still possible to maintain it? And Hungary is part of the NATO and also part of the European Union. How do you think, how can a smaller country can, can achieve this? Well, within Europe, you, you, you have to find allies. And right now, uh, I think in France, in Macron, you, there is a kindred spirit. Uh, yes, you play subtly. I think Hungary would be better off if it keeps a lower profile. But I'm told that for Hungarian people, it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, but Sorry, we are setting the narrative. <laughs> We, each of us has our own nature, and we cannot, we cannot deny our own nature, so we have to work with it. But if I were hungry, I would find allies who are sympathetic to your point of view, but don't assert the position so strongly that it undermines the entire grouping. Then you will be harming yourself. In other words, within the grouping, be clear, be consistent, be moral. And then over time, by what you say and by your con constancy, be an influence on others. You will never have enough weight to use weight alone. So you need powers of persuasion and moral influence, which I sense you have because of your own history, your own culture. 
I see the way Castle Hill is being redeveloped and how determined you are to maintain your own identity, I think that is your greatest strength. But it's not easy to have everything translated into your language, to assert a separateness which others may dislike. Yeah. But you do that by also respecting other separateness. If I respect that you are different, you are more likely to respect that I'm different. And in this way, you assert your position softly. And that you may have to do. Yeah. I suppose in terms of you know, Hungary's position with regard to Europe, and you could compare that with Singapore's position re regarding ASEAN as a grouping. The, the difficulty with Hungary is that unlike ASEAN, ASEAN has a, um, a, a treaty of amity and cooperation which excludes um, other members interfering with the internal affairs of states within the grouping. The problem with Europe is it wants to interfere in the eternal affairs of Hungary, which is um, problematic, really. So the, the European role with regard to states within its um, orbit um, is, is in some ways very different from, from the role that states occupy within ASEAN. And like back in the late 90s, it was seen that Europe was a model for ASEAN. Maybe um, ASEAN has something to teach Europe at the moment. When I was a trade minister, I had on my desk the Treaty of Rome, 80 pages, an inspirational document. I referred to it from time to time because Singapore was very active in the ASEAN construction. And for the initial steps, we followed the European common market. The European construction has reached such a point where it's extremely complicated and we've decided that we will not follow Europe because it will not work for us. I'm not sure how well it's working for Europe. When you talk about Europe imposing values on you, I go back to the principle of subsidiarity. You should only take away autonomy if that deprivation benefits you. And my feeling, I've written about it, I've spoken about it, uh, even though I'm not qualified to talk about it since I'm not European, is that Europe has departed from the principle of subsidiarity, which is its founding principle. And in some sense, Hungary is truer to the founding principle of Europe than Europe is today, generally speaking. Thank you. Victor? Uh, actually, I'm a China researcher, so when you mentioned that the elephant in the room is China, I was very happy because I, I really want to ask this question that what should we see on China? So when, when we are watching China, what, what, what is the thing we really have to focus? Because of course we all read economists and those kind of Western papers and they try to tell a story about China. But, but with your experience, what, you, what would you say? What, what, what we have to really understand about China and what should we focus on in the next coming years, decades? I've been to, to Europe over a hundred times. I don't think I, I have more than a superficial understanding of Europe. China is twice the size of Europe, in population and, and in, in land area maybe three times, or more, more, let's say twice. So it's a complex reality. There's no danger that any European will understand too much about China. So when I meet young European friends who ask me for advice, I say, go to China. Find any and every reason to go to China at least once a year. I say it will be good for you, and there's no danger that you will learn too much. <laughs> How should, why should you not? If you are a parent, and this economy is going to be bigger than any, anyone else on earth by a big margin, you better know it, whether for offensive reasons or for defensive reasons. And you should teach your, chi your, your children Chinese, or at least get them interested because it will be a great asset to them. But 
the mood now is Confucius Institutes or the subversion. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, for the life of me, understand the current mood. When I was in Cambridge, Joseph Needham was still master of Gonville and Keys College. He had a profound influence on me. His encyclopedic work, Sense and Civilization of China, reached a depth of analysis which even the Chinese themselves appreciated. That scholarship has weakened greatly, not just in Cambridge, but throughout Europe. And yet China is getting bigger. So something needs to be done desperately. I've, I've, because of my association with the Catholic Church, I've, I have this dream, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe Hungary can play some kind of a role. I, I don't know. It would be good if China understands, has a university for classical studies. Not just a language, you know, Roman and Greek but understand the Roman world, understand uh, classical Europe. And Europe in turn helps China, uh, and China in turn helps Europe develop a university for understanding China. And you need more than a university to understand China. The Jesuits did a lot with very little. And even that, according to Joseph Needham, created the basis of the French Revolution. Because the Jesuits said, remarkably, you have a moral order without organized religion. How could that be possible? Because it was never in the European experience. So he wrote about it, translated the Chinese classics into Latin. According to Needham, the, the, the French encyclopedists, men like Voltaire and Descartes, when they read all this, they said, yes, that's our answer to the Catholic Church domination, the Catholic mind suppression of independent thought. And it began a period of dechristianization. But beyond a point, dechristianization is very dangerous because you cut off your own legs. If you're not rooted, how do you change? China, in this transformation, keeps on going back to its own history. So the more your branches grow, the deeper your roots go. But in the current mode of Europe is you chop off your legs. I said, this will help me to change. To me, that's very dangerous. So when I see, when I was brief on Castle Hill, and why the the Hungarian parliament is neo-Gothic and not neoclassical. I say there's a certain wisdom in the way your leaders think because don't lose your roots. You lose your roots, you'll be swept away. You'll be cast aside. Now, I do Tai Chi. You know, I think you're familiar with Tai Chi. You know? Tai Chi has a certain principle that the more rooted you are, the freer you are. <laughs> if you're not rooted, you lose your balance. If you are rooted, you can do pirouettes and maintain balance. So rootedness is very important. Anyway, this is just a view from afar. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel embarrassed to talk about this because I know very little about Hungary. I just have a slight sense of you, which I like. <laughs> and, and I'm just giving you my, 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 my impressions. Well, I think they're fascinating. Um... <laughs> No, no, forgive me if I, if I speak out of turn. <laughs> so, uh, uh, George has made some very intriguing pronouncements. I wonder if there's questions from the audience. That... Hello, good evening. Um, Alex Stemp. Um, I've really um, enjoyed your um, discussion this evening. Thank you very much. It's been most illuminating. Um, you mentioned briefly about Donald Trump, but just very briefly, like halfway through this. But I want to know, because the West is at such sort of crossroads, if the, Trump, if the election next year in the US goes to Trump, or if it goes to Biden or anyone, any Democrat, how does that affect 
um, world affairs from your perspective. Thank you. The biggest uncertainty in the world today is not US-China relations. It is what is happening in the US itself. Yeah. And the fight between the two sides has become increasingly acrimonious. And they no longer see themselves as, as a college. This is almost an intellectual civil war, an ideological civil war. And in the last three years, millions of firearms have been purchased in America. And these firearms are not to be used against China or Russia. They are, they are intended to be used against fellow Americans. The manner in which the politics have become so divided, I think, frightens everybody. And all of us, Hungary, Singapore, Europe, China, think about it. It's one of scenarios. Trump returns. What does it mean? Now, he's capricious. He's outrageous. It's a liar. But I was told by a Democratic senator, an old friend of mine, who has crossed swords with Trump before, that there are certain core positions which Trump, inside Trump, which has never changed. He said these are the four core positions. He's against free immigration. He's against free trade. He's against his pro-business. And he's against war. Well, I think it's a fair position to take that you should be against the free movement of people. Because beyond a point, people say, hey, this, this village is no longer mine. I'm no longer welcoming strangers. The strangers have taken over the village. So today, if you go to London or Paris, you have that feeling. The migrants have taken over the city. And the Chinese, they don't want Beijing and Shanghai to be like London and New York. They like their own homogeneity the way you like your own homogeneity in Hungary. On Sunday, when I, my wife and I wanted to attend Mass, we were interrogated. They said, no, you know, it's a long service. You cannot come out. <laughs> my wife said, look, I'm a Catholic. She showed her crucifix. Uh, so someone intervened and said, you know, they're dignitaries, you know. So <laughs> grumpily, we were admitted into Mass. I thought, it is a bit much. You know? I don't, I've never had that kind of a unwelcome in other churches in the world. But maybe it's part of the Hungarian character that, <laughs> that you want to preserve your own identity. But this is a struggle in America. Free trade. Well, beyond a point, free trade will benefit some people. They become very rich. But other people will be thrown out of work. And if you don't have a long view you will end up destroying capabilities. So in the US today, manufacturing is in decline for a long time. Being pro-business, I think few of, us, few of us will quarrel with that. Being anti-war, I think all of us should be happy. So I don't see the return of Trump as an unmitigated disaster at all, but it will certainly stir the pot. Yeah. And all of us are... <laughs> imagining it in order to be prepared for it. Great. Thank you. There's, there's a gentleman at the back and one in the row in front. There's been a lot of talk about the Ukrainian war, but none so positive that you mentioned that according to the gentleman's understanding, you suggested that within the course of few months, there would be a push for peace negotiations. What makes you believe that? And if you could have elaborate on it, he would be grateful. Uh, I was just repeating Kissinger. He, he thinks that by the end of the year, there could be moves towards negotiations. And I was wondering why he chose the end of the year. At the end of the year, what happens on the battlefield will happen. Then in the US, Domestic politics will preoccupy both sides. If in the coming months, Ukraine has a great victory, 
they must know when to stop. Because if they don't stop, Russia will have to move again. And the world will go closer to the brink. If Russia makes progress on the battlefield, I hope they know when to stop also. Because if they don't stop, there'll be a new round of escalation. And we'll also move towards the brink. So on either side, there has to be a certain realism. Emotionally, it's very difficult to accept. But in the end, you may have a Cyprus solution or a North Korean solution, which is only a ceasefire solution, not a peace agreement. I doubt there'll be a peace agreement for decades to come. Because Europe and America cannot accept Russia winning, and Russia cannot afford to lose. But both sides can agree on a ceasefire. And there'll be intense negotiations over not just boundaries, but over the rights of populations on both sides of whatever boundary is drawn. Yeah. And in that complex situation, and negotiations may take two, three years, the way they did in Vietnam or, or, or Korea. Yeah. But in the end, you need negotiations. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's a gentleman. No, just, just that. Thank you. Um, Heinrich Kreft, I'm a German diplomat, but currently professor here at Andrasi University. Um, Thank you very much for your, for your presentation and uh, given your deep, deep knowledge on China, I would like to, to press you a little bit more on, on the, uh, the issue you just uh, touched already upon. You mentioned China will play a role in, uh, in the peace uh, settlement or in the ceasefire, whatever we will see in, uh, in Ukraine, Russia. Um, given China's uh, interest in sovereignty, of a state, uh, integrity of, uh, of borders, of territorial integrity. Um, what could you imagine? What could be China's role in such a process? It will be a process, and I totally agree with you. It will take a long time. And uh, what we might see at the end of this year will be very different what we might see in a couple of years from now. But given your very deep knowledge of China, what could be China's role, China's position in this? They will not try to uh, make specific proposals. They will make suggestions in certain directions. It's a very Chinese way, you know, where you don't want anybody to lose face. So they say, have you considered this? And then by little hints, they will try to find feasible zones. Now, right now, there's no feasible zone. And the Americans don't want China to play a role. And China doesn't want to interpose itself. It's just saying, I'm here. If you think I can help, I will help. If you don't think I can help, it's OK. It's OK. If South Africa, if Brazil, if the Pope wants to help, well, maybe they can help. And maybe we can help together. That's the kind of position China takes. But China has one advantage. It can put money. It can rebuild infrastructure. And that will, that will make any solution easier because you can help people. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I see them playing a role. Thank you. Uh, there's one question. Can, can you make it quite quick? We've only got a about five minutes left. Certainly, yeah, thank you. Uh, there was a lot of talk about China, about the US and Europe, but uh, much less about Singapore. Uh, the founding of, of modern Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, is considered to be uh, a great statement. Uh, and if you could elaborate what memories you treasure of him and what you think made him such an outstanding statement. Thank you. You're talking about Lee Kuan Yew? Yeah, yeah. What made him outstanding? He had range. He could go into great detail on a specific subject, like uh, greenery, like the environment. And he also had a sense of history. Uh, I don't think he was, he was not a historian. And neither did he have a deep knowledge of history, but he had a sense of history. 
and he had a sense of China. Above all, he was a political realist. Yeah. I'm writing my third book of musings will be published at the end of August. I have two chapters on working with Lee Kuan Yew. So in it, I said, my own sense of him is when he interacts with somebody, the first step in this algorithm is what is a power relationship? I've seen him deal with his political enemies. I've seen him deal with US presidents, Chinese leaders. I've seen him deal with service staff, drivers. And with him, the power relationship comes first. He adjusts to the power relationship. If I have power over you, now I can be very polite. Because you will be polite to me anyway. <laughs> when he deals with America, he knows that he's dealing with big power. But he's not going to be steamrolled over. Yeah. But he's a complex figure. And uh, over time, an all-rounded perspective of Lee Kuan Yew will emerge in Singapore, which will not reduce his greatness, which may affect some of the hagiography, but which will present him as a human being, as a political leader who was remarkable, but who had his own blind spots and faults. That's interesting because um, you mentioned um, the Thucydides trap, uh, and, and that was a very Western perspective. But the the, the theorist that, that produced that was Graham Allenson, who also thought Lee Kuan Yew was the greatest statesman of the 20th century, which is quite interesting. Uh, last question. Hi, I'm Ivan Wagner. You've been around the world. I know a lot of civilizations and cultures. But let's stay in Singapore. What are you most proud about to be a Singaporean? Um, OK. What is the Singapore idea? If you become a Singaporean, do you become smaller or do you become bigger? Let's say you're Chinese citizen, and you give up your Chinese passport, and you become a Singaporean. Well, that's a big diminution. You know? If you're European, you become Singaporean. Because we don't allow dual nationalities. So to me, a Singaporean should enlarge you, not reduce you. That if you're Hungarian, you become Singaporean. Please be Hungarian. Please be proud of your heritage. We only ask of you one thing. Have a heart big enough and a mind broad enough to accept people not like yourself. Then you become Singaporean. In other words, to be, to be Singaporean is to add additional lines of code which link you to others. I would be proud of such a Singapore. I would not be proud of a Singapore which says, you're Hungarian, you better forget being Hungarian. You're now Singaporean. Then we become small. This is a struggle. This is a struggle, yeah. But, but one you've overcome, I think. <laughs> well, I, th I think that draws proceedings to a close. That was ob obviously the audience didn't have to ask to applaud you. They did it spontaneously, George. So thank you, Mr. Yeo. Thank you, Choba. And thank you, Victor. And uh, no doubt there'll be some uh, refreshments afterwards and we can continue the conversation. But thank you. Thank you.